जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी Paramarupa, computer bag from which this came, the whole bag. Thank you. I couldn't be here on a Sunday. That's like the best day, right? Is this the next best day, right? Yeah. 
Maybe one of these days they'll teach us how to expand ourselves. We can be in two places at once. But I don't know how to do that. Oh, here we are, Saturday. And because yesterday was Radharani's appearance day, I thought it'd be appropriate to speak about Radharani's appearance day. Is that a nice topic? Now, is there anybody here that's... Do you know who is Srimati Radharani, our guest here on the seat? Have you heard of Radharani? Yeah, I, I, I was on this DVD yesterday. It's um, so, okay. You're a little bit acquainted. Yeah. Okay. The reason I'm asking you is... When chanting Jai Radha Madhava, I've learned as a speaker, look around and see who doesn't know the words to Jai Radha Madhava. Because that's a new person. That's why, yeah, that's why I'm asking, do you know who is Radharani? So we're going to be speaking about Radharani. Here's a nice painting of Radharani. Now you know who is Krishna. Okay. Radharani using Śrīla Prabhupāda's words, the tender spiritual counterpart. There's the potent and there's the potency. There's the sun and there's the sunshine. And the sun and the sunshine are inseparable. You won't find one without the other or vice versa. So Radha is the potency internal pleasure potency of Krishna. They're inseparable. And yet, we find in Chaitanya Charitamrita that one entity, Radha Krishna, just like sun and sunshine, they appear eternally in two forms. One entity in two forms. And uh, the, the form of Radha is a complexion that's golden, like molten gold, and Krishna's complexion is like that of a monsoon cloud, dark, heavy, ready for the downpour of rain kind of cloud. That's his complexion. And as the tender feminine counterpart, she has unequaled love. The love that Radha has for Krishna is superlative. It's so strong that all of the other inhabitants or residents in Goloka Vrindavan they imbibe some portion of her love for Krishna. That is to say, in Goloka, everyone, even those that apparently are opposing Jatila and Katila, even those that are apparently opposing the meeting of Radha and Krishna, it's to enhance the meeting of Radha and Krishna. That's their, the bhava that permeates, the mood of love that permeates their principal relationship. They have a principal relationship and it's coated or covered by that particular kind of love. So, I plan to do three things. The first one is describe to you what I have understood are different explanations of the appearance of Srimati Radharani. because, I'm now looking at our friend over here, according to the Vedic picture of time, time moves in cycles. Summer, fall, winter, spring, that's one kind of cycle. Day and night, another kind of cycle. Everything moves in cycles. Birth, death, disease, and old age, birth, death, disease. There's cycles of time. There's small ones, medium ones, and really big ones. And one of the cycles of time 
is a day of Brahma and it's a really big number without going through the math. It's a big number. And at the end of each day of Brahma is a night of Brahma that's of equal duration as his day. And Krishna in his pastimes in Vrindavan appears once every day. There's 1,000 of those every day. It's the other 999 plus one makes a thousand. The other 999 Krishna appears but he doesn't appear in Vrindavan. He appears as the four-armed Vasudev Krishna just like he appeared in the prison house of Kamsa. But only one of those he appears and then goes to perform his pastimes in Vrindavan. And when he does, Radharani comes too. And all of his eternal associates come too to display to the world this very, 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 it's a triple very, special, unique kind of love found only in Goloka, predominated by the mood of the love of Radha for Krishna. All the residents of Vrindavan partake of that sweetness, wishing to see and enhance the love of Radha and Krishna. So, each day of Brahma, there's a slightly different variation on the theme of the appearance of Krishna and the appearance of Radha. So there's some nice explanations of the appearance of Srimati Radharani, and I'm going to share with you five. So there's one that's very common that we hear, and that is Radharani appeared in Ravel. Anyone here been to Ravel? How many here have been to Ravel? Okay. May you all one day visit. It's a very wonderful place. Here's, as you can see, it's not spoiled by commercial anything. It's at least presently. It's uh, very sublime and simple. And here's the entryway to the temple with the friendly priests waiting for you to come and take darshan of the deity. And it's uh, early in the morning when commonly devotees go. That's when I've gone at least, real early in the morning. And so the deities are still at rest when we go and they allowed us with a little contribution to take pictures of the deities while they're still at rest. By the side of the palace of Rishabhanu, the father of Srimati Radharani, there was a tributary of the, of the Jamuna River that used to flow there. Now it doesn't flow there. But the vestiges are there, as you can see, over here and other places. And right by the side of the house was a flow of the river Jamuna. So every morning, Rishabhana would go take his bath in the sacred Jamuna, and one morning, Early in the morning, before the sun rose, much to his surprise, there was a very effulgent lotus flower, golden in color, in the middle of the river Jamuna. And so he waded out into the river and looking inside the petals of the lotus, he saw a little golden girl. Because he, Brishabhanu, and his wife, Kirtida, they very much desired to have a daughter, while Nanda Jasoda desired to have a son. They were friends. They were very close friends. No daughter, no daughter, no daughter. And inside this lotus was a daughter, a young girl, baby girl, golden, glowing. And just by touching, picking, he picked up the child a voice came saying, this is the daughter that you desired. You take care of her as your daughter. So, that was Radharani. And Radharani was taken back to the palace of Rishubhanu. And 
he simply declared to his wife what happened and said, this is our daughter. We will call her Radha. And so they raised the child as their own child, their own daughter. The daughter of Vishabhanu and Kirtida. And around this time, Narada Muni became a very curious. He wanted, he knew that wherever Krishna had, had just before some short number of days, Ashtami and Ashtami, <laughs> Krishna had appeared. And so somewhere there must be Radharani making her appearance. So he did what sadhus sometimes do, he went door to door in Braja, saying, do you have a newborn daughter? I'd like to give my blessings to your newborn daughter. Mm -hmm. Oh, Narada Muni giving blessings to her. So he was looking for Radharani. And he was a little disappointed, no Radharani. And so time passed. He made his way to Ravo, to the palace of Rishabhanu, and said, I've come to give blessings to any newborn children. And so he said, oh, I have a son. And did you know that Radharani had an elder brother? What was the elder brother's name? Sridham. Sridham. So they introduced Sridham to Narada Muni, who was happy to see Sridham, but it wasn't Radharani. Mm -hmm. So he was now taking his leave, and Rishabhanu said, wait, wait, wait. We do have a newborn daughter, but she's, she doesn't speak. And she apparently doesn't, even, doesn't hear either. She doesn't respond to any sound and her eyes are closed. It's like blind, deaf, and dumb. So, you're a sadhu. Maybe you have some mantras or some way that you can make her good again. He said, oh, can you bring me to see your daughter? So when he came to see his daughter, his hair stood on end, just seeing her, the little he wanted to see Radha in this little infant, newborn form. And he controlled his ecstasy and said to Vrishabhanu, I do know some special mantras, but I, ha they're, they're, I have to chant them aloud and they have to be private. And I need certain paraphernalia. Can you bring the following paraphernalia. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Narada Muni, you must be so gifted. I'm sure everything's going to come out nice. Mm -hmm. So, as soon as the, all the paraphernalia was prepared, he closed the door and fell on his before Radharani's crib and paid obeisances again and again and worshipped her to his heart's content, mm -hmm. loudly chanting so many mantras and left the room saying it didn't work quite the way I thought it would work yet. <laughs> but I have a suggestion. The suggestion is you hold a big festival in the honor of the appearance of your daughter and invite all the residents of Gokul. Make sure you invite Nanda in Jasoda. Oh yes, very good idea. I was thinking of doing the same, but now coming from you, it would definitely do so. Big festival. Nanda and Jasoda came. Their palace, not so far away. And across, they brought Nanda Nandana. And as all the adults were doing what adults do, having a nice time, children to do what children to do. They were playing and so Krishna was still crawling and 
he crawled into the very room where Srimati Radharani was and he lifted himself over the edge of the crib of Radharani and she opened her eyes and called out loudly for the first time making some sound and it was a very loud sound she was very happy so everyone came to see oh Narada Muni gave the blessing that our daughter can become well again by the mercy of Narada Muni this has happened Radha didn't want to see anything other than Krishna. She didn't want to speak anything other than in relation to Krishna. She didn't want to hear anything other than Krishna. That's Srimati Radharani. So that's one of the five narrations of the appearance of Srimati Radharani. And then there's a, a second one that's very similar where Vishabhanu not, Radharani appears in her, her ancestral home, Varsana. And near Varsana is Vrishabhanu Kund, and Vrishabhanu was taking his bath in Vrishabhanu Kund, and Radha appeared on top of a lotus flower. It's a very similar narration. Prabhupada explained, I'm sure you've heard this, that Krishna's pastimes have a certain thread, or he used the word spool. I've heard him speak this so many times, it's apparently making reference to the way that moving pictures were shown on a spool, just like a thread, excuse me, thread is on a spool. They'd run it through the projector, image after image, so Krishna's pastime would replay again and again. There's not like reruns exactly, but a certain rasa or exchange of love with his devotees, but at the same time, some variation on the theme because variety is the mother of enjoyment. He would explain like that. Same theme, but some variety. So a third pastime of Radharani's appearance was discussed by Śrīla Prabhupāda long ago in Montreal, very early in the Hare Krishna movement, and there's a recording of it. And he describes the appearance of Radharani that sounds like the appearance of Sita. And that is, Vrishabhanu was plowing a field to prepare for a yajna and as he was plowing the field, from the field came a golden child, a female child. And so he accepted this is the Lord's arrangement and he accepted the golden child as his daughter and she became Radha. That pastime is verified in one of the Puranas, I forget, Skanda Purana, which Purana I forget. But it's a pastime directly in one of the Puranas. And that's what Prabhupada narrated. It's not that he didn't know the one, this other one. He just, for whatever his reason, he chose to narrate that one. Then comes a very complicated pastime, number four, <coughs> described by Rupa Goswami in Dalita Madhava. You better hold on to your socks. <laughs> The story is narrated by Purnamasi. This is a, a, a photograph of the deity of Purnamasi very near the um, place where Krishna performed rasa dance in Vrindavan. Vangshivat is one of the places where Krishna performed rasa dance. And this deity of Purna, Purnamasi is there. Purnamasi is the yoga maya potency of Krishna in his pastimes. She orchestrates all of his pastimes. And in the pastime of Krishna, Purnamasi is the mother of Krishna's spiritual master, Sandipani Muni, and the grandmother 
or Sandipani Muni's son, is Madhu Mangal. So there's this nice description. Before Krishna appeared, Purnamasi just mysteriously showed up in Vrindavan with her grandson, a funny Brahmin, little chubby young boy. A little older than Krishna, but, you know, very young. And because of her, just her presence, we all know what it's like to be in the presence of someone that's exceptionally qualified, pious, spirits, etc. Everyone just accepted that she's, she's a person that we look up to. Besides of her age, just her spiritual presence. So she had that respect of everyone. She carried that quality that everyone respected and she just orchestrated all of Krishna's pastimes. So Rupa Goswami writes, in the Lita Madhava, where Purnamasi is describing to Gargi. Gargi is the daughter of Gargamuni. And she's telling this story that's really complicated, saying the only other two persons I explained this to were Rohini and Yashoda. And she says that she heard it from Narada Muni. It's not like in that sequence, but that's part of the whole narration. Very different. And the narration begins with the Vindhya hills being jealous of the Himalaya mountains. Himalaya hills means small and Himalaya mountains means big and so he was jealous. Specifically, so this is hills that are personified. Piari's is listening really carefully. <laughs> Vindhya understood that the Himalayas gave birth to a female child, Himavati, who became then the wife of Mahadev, Lord Shiva. So Vindhya wanted a daughter who would marry someone who would be able to defeat Mahadev. <laughs> so he underwent great austerities for a long time, worshipping Brahma. Eventually Brahma appeared. My dear Vindya, what is it that you would like? Very severe austerities. And Vindya said, I would like a daughter who would become married to a qualified person who would be able to defeat Mahadev in battle. So he, the one who defeated Mahadev in battle, could be known as Rajendra, Raja Indra, the, the king of kings. Tatastu, so be it. And Vindhya was very happy, and according to Lalita Madhava, Brahma became a little anxious. I made this benediction, but how is it possible? Who can defeat Mahadev? But he wants a daughter, so Vindhya underwent great austerities, excuse me, Brahma underwent great austerities to worship Radharani. And after long austerities, Radharani appeared before Vindhya and said, my, my dear Vindhya, what is it that you would like? Excuse me, Brahma, Brahma, what would you like? Please make an arrangement that Vindhya can have as a daughter 
one who would in battle be able to defeat Mahadev, Lord Shiva. She said very well. And by the Yoga Maya's arrangement, there were two daughters. No, he wanted one, but he got two daughters. In the womb of the wife of Vrishabhanu, her name is? Do you remember? This young girl sitting in the front row. Kirtida, very good. So in the womb of Kirtida, there's a daughter, and Chandrabhanu, in his wife's womb, there's a daughter. Those two shall be transferred into the womb of Vindya's wife. So they were already pregnant. Doesn't say exactly how that happened. Something like, something like the transfer of Balaram from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini. Doesn't give that detail, how that was done. And there were two daughters born. After some time, the daughters of Vindhya. So, Vindhya, having received this benediction from Brahma, then wanted to do the proper rituals for the birth of these two girls. So he had a ceremony going on where the Brahmas were performing the proper rituals. Meanwhile, back in Mathura, Devaki gave birth to her eighth child, Krishna. Krishna was transferred by Vasudeva to the side of Yashoda. Then the female child was taken back. Kamsa heard that the eighth child of Devaki was born. He came, tried to kill the child, but as he was raising the child, to smash the child on a rock. He was a cruel person. Yogamaya slipped from his hand and taking the form of Durga, said two things. Kamsa, you are such a fool. But it's a little different than the eighth child of Devaki. He said, you who were previously Kalanami, who was killed by the weapons of Vishnu, the club and the disc of Vishnu, that very same personality, one who is praised by all in the three worlds has taken birth somewhere on earth. And you will meet your destruction. And also you should know, Kamsa, very soon, eight young girls will take their birth. And two of them, of those eight, whoever marries them will rule the world and be the greatest personality in all existence. And Durga disappeared before his eyes. Hearing this, <clears throat> Kamsa gave the order to Putana. Kill all little boys and kidnap all little girls. Now Putana didn't mind killing both, but that was the order. So as she was doing her thing, soaring through the air mystically, traveling here and there, she saw this yagya that was being performed by Vindhya and the brahmanas. She saw two young girls. She swooped down to pick up the two young girls and was flying away, her 
mystic power. Vindhya was in big anxiety. He instructed the brahmanas, chant mantras, stop her. So they stopped the yagya, they chanted the mantras, and these were effective brahmanas. Putana was becoming weaker and weaker and weaker to the, through the power of those mantras. And one of the girls, according to Rupa Goswami, one of the girls slipped from her hand, fell in a river near the kingdom of King Bhishmaka. King Bhishmaka found the daughter in the river and rescued the daughter and accepted the daughter as his own. And the second child, also, as he became weaker and weaker, slipped from her hand, fell on the ground. I, Purnamasi, found the child, turned the child over to Mukhara. Mukhara is the grandmother of Radha, or Mukhara is the mother of Kirtida's mother. Excuse me, Radha's mother. She's the mother of Kirtida. Mukhara is the mother of Kirtida. So remember this because that comes with appearance number five story. <laughs> Mukhara is the mother of Kirtida, who is the mother of Radha. So accept this child. This is the child of your of Vrishabhanu. So treat the child this way. So be, because Purnamasi said, everyone said, yes. They just had all faith in her. That was Radha. So, um, after some time, the child, listen carefully, it's very complicated. The child that was being raised by King Bhishmaka, that's, who's that? Rukmini. Rukmini. That child was instructed by Jambavan. Jambavan was instructed by, now there's um, two editions of Lalita Madhava that I'm not so one says this and the other says, Vindhya instructed, and other says, Durga instructed, but she, he, Jambavan was instructed to take that daughter after the fifth year and bring the daughter to the care of Vishabhanu. Excuse me. Not Vishabhanu. Yes, Vishabhanu. Do I have it right? No. Chandrabhanu. 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 And that her name is Chandravali. Is that right? That's right. Chandravali. Chandravali. So, Lalita Madhava goes on and on. It gets more complicated. And, you know, the... the in the course of Purnamasi relating this to Gargi, Gargi goes, wow. <laughs> and then what happened, you know, so it goes on like that, that I didn't understand these things. So he's narrating, Rupa Goswami is narrating how the 16,108 queens of Krishna were actually gopis in Vrindavan that wanted to have Krishna as her husband and it was arranged that they could become Krishna's wives in Dwaraka. It's really far out. If you want to, you know, scratch a hole in your head, you can read through it. Or Shivaram Maharaj has, has detailed it to some degree in his writings. But that's another appearance of Radharani, according to Rupa Goswami. You ready for another one? 
it's, it's also complicated. <laughs> now, uh, the, the, the reference source is one of the Puranas. I haven't been able to find out which of the Puranas this reference comes from. Maybe somebody in our audience knows. Who was the person, who was the Deva that Radharani worshipped? Surya. So this narration says that Surya, the sun god, wanted to have as his daughter Gokuleshwari. So he underwent some austerities and penances and worship of Lord Hari towards that end. And as time passed on earth, in um, Gokula, there was a king. Now I have to look at my notes here. Yeah, a king within the cowherd community named Maha Banu. Banu is the name of the son. So he, Mahabanu, had five sons. Rishabanu was one of his five sons. And after some time, Rishabanu was selected to become the next king following Mahabanu. And Rishabanu was very pious, very wealthy. He did many, many, many Rajasuya Yagyas, hundreds. Rajasuya Yagyas, like, you have to have a lot of wealth to do when Rajasuya Yagya, and he did hundreds. And he had, he was a Rajarshi, he was a great king, even living in the cowherd community. Nearby, in another village, there was uh, in Braja, there was a, a cowherd man named Bindu. And Bindu had a wife named Mukara. And Bindu and Mukara together had five sons and three daughters. And one of the daughters of Bindu and Mukara was Kirtida. After some time, King Vishibanu married Kirtida. And although they were married for some time, no children. So they did what people do when there's no children. They went to brahmanas and performed rituals and this austerity and that fasting and different, different, different procedures and no children. Kirtida suggested to Vrishabhanu, why don't you worship, why don't we worship Katyayani? Now those of you that are familiar with Srimad Bhagavatam though, the young gopi girls they worship Katyayani to get Krishna as their husband, and there's this very specific explanation. It's not the demigoddess Katyayani, it's the spiritual counterpart, the prototype Katyayani, the internal potency, Katyayani. So they worship Katyayani very strongly and carefully for some period of time. Katyayani Devi appeared personally before them. And, you know, the standard line, what is it you wish? Oh, just your coming before us is, is everything. We're completely satisfied, but if you really want us to take some benediction, um, we would like a daughter. Um, 
And so the instruction is from Katyayani was very interesting. Without accepting Harinam, you can't fulfill anything properly. So take to the chanting of the holy name. And so Vrishabhanu and Kirtida searched for a sadhu that could give them the holy name. They found Kratu Muni and Kratu Muni uh, recited different slokas from the Puranas and explained that whether this, that or the other thing without the, the holy name one cannot achieve the desired result the spiritual perfection. And so he gave them, specifically this Purana indicates the Maha Mantra, our very familiar Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So Rishabhanu went back to the place where he was worshiping Katyayani by the bank of the river Jamuna and with great devotion um, he continued his worship of the holy name. Again, Katyayani appeared. And Katyayani extended her hands, and in her hands was a box, and in the box was Radharani from the chanting of the holy name. And Vrishabhanda was very happy and he brought the box with a golden child in the box back to show his good wife Kirti Da. And on this auspicious day, Radharani's appearance day, which was yesterday, Srimati Radharani made his appearance in the home of Vrishabhanda and Kirti Da. And there may be others that I don't know. <laughs> but I thought, because I was told Piari would kind of give me some, you know, not a cap of time, I want to tell two more stories. Along with the appearance of Radharani, very wonderful description is there, the appearance of Radhakund. Now many of you know the story. And it's nice to hear it again and again. This young girl, he, she probably knows the whole story, can tell the whole thing. Ask her, does you know the story of the appearance of Radhakund? This, yes, you? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Well, here are some images that you'll like, I think. This is a, an, uh, a Google photo of Govardhan Hill. Now, it shows it at a diagonal, although it's actually exactly, almost exactly north and south. But to fit it on the screen, it's at a diagonal. And this is the, the southern end, and that's the northern end. And this middle section, that's the Govardhan town, very built up. And then up here, here's a, a closer image of Radhakund and Shamakund at the northern top. It's, it's said that Govardhan is shaped like a peacock. This is the, the this middle section of the body of a peacock on the branch. This is the tail dangling down. This is his long neck and then the head with the eyes. Mm -hmm. The mouth of the peacock and the head of the peacock and the eyes. So Radha Kund, Shama Kund are like that position-wise on the hill of Govardhan. So the appearance of Radha Kund goes like this. One of the demons that Kamsa had sent to terrorize the resident of Vrindavan and to kill Krishna was Arishta. And when Arishta came, he was humongous. His horns were scraping the clouds and his the hump on the back of his shoulders was way up in the air and as he, as he charged, the whole earth trembled. There's many other things. He, he, he went to where the, the cows were and they were terrorized, the cows 
Rishta. So these are cow herds and they have to protect the cows. So what do they do? Krishna! And the gopis, when they saw Rishta coming, they embraced a tamal tree. Krishna! When Krishna heard the cries of his devotees, he came at once. And facing Arishta, he tightened his belt and the cowherd boys are going, you know, Krishna, he'll take care of him. This huge guy, he'll take care of him. So some taunts back and forth, Krishna to Arista. Arista lowered his horns, moved his hooves, sent some dust flying and started charging to catch Krishna with his horns and kill him. And Krishna just deftly stepped out of the way and he went tumbling to the ground. And he got up and charged again. As Arishta attacked again, Krishna grabbed him by his horns and knocked him to the ground with his foot. And then he broke off the horns and started smashing him and thrashing him with the horns. Like a wet rag. And Arishta left his life. So Krishna had wanted to give the good news to the residents of Vrindavan. Arishta is no longer going to torment you. So he went first to the gopis to give them the good news. Everything, the coast is clear. <laughs> Everything is fine now. And they said, everything's not fine. You killed the bull. So you don't come near us. And Krishna said, he wasn't a bull, he was a demon in the shape of a bull. And he was terrorizing and tormenting everybody and so everyone wanted me, I just took care of him, you should be happy. He said, this is a big sin. He may have just been in the form of a bull, but you killed the bull. <laughs> so you're gonna come near us, you have to undergo great austerities to purify yourself. And Krishna said, well, what austerities do you recommend? And he said, you know, but you're pretending as if you don't know, we'll tell you. You have to bathe in all the sacred rivers of the entire universe. Then you can come near us. And Krishna smiled and said, no problem. He took his flute, made marks in the ground with his flute, made a big depression very quickly, and then called the rivers personified to come before him with palms folded. Yes, yes, some service. What is it? What is it? Using your celestial waters, please fill up this kund so I can take my sacred bath. Immediately did. Krishna took his bath and came out of uh, Shamakund and said, Mission accomplished. <laughs> but now, my dear gopis, you have falsely accused me of sin. And you know what happens when you falsely accuse someone of a wrongdoing? You have to bear the full responsibility for that wrongdoing yourself because you falsely accused them. So you're going to have to atone for falsely accusing me. And they said, what atonement? He said, the same atonement, same offense. And so Radharani smiled. She took off one of her bangles and held it up in the air. That's all it took. All the gopis took their bangles and very quickly, the teamwork, they dug Radha Kund. And Krishna said, that was very good. <laughs> but now how are you going to fill it with celestial waters? If you like, 
we can make a little stream in between your kund and my kund and fill up your kund, you can take your sacred bath. He said, no way. You contaminated your kund with your sinful reactions. Radharani's kund is not going to have any of that. We have another solution. They made a human chain to Manasi Ganga, if you remember from that image that's near the Govardhan town, and singing Radha's name, they brought buckets of water, empty ones going this way, full ones going that way, and very quickly they filled up Radha Kund and took their sacred bath. So that's how Radha Kund was formed in this wonderful pastime of Radha and Krishna. Now this pastime was performed when they were very young, just like little children. But it's not just little child's play, it's a transcendental exchange between the tender feminine counterpart of Krishna, the enjoyer of everything and everyone, and the source of everything, Krishna himself. Now there are times during the rainy season when uh, the water between the two kunds becomes flooded anyways. And if you look closely there's this, what's called the sangam, and even today there's, the water does flow between the two. And in this sangam area, this place in the middle, um, when it gets flooded, you can see the, where Radha and Krishna would sit and enjoy their pastimes. So that's what that little structure in the middle signifies. And here's on a nice day, the whole of Radha Kund. And over here, this is the place where Janava would sit the wife of Lord Nityananda, and she would chant and chant and chant the holy name. Under that little tree there, they had a little bhajan kutir for her. And um, she was able to see Krishna without details. This is Vishnu Das's rendering of what it may have looked like when Radha and Krishna were present. Here's another where they're enjoying pastimes together in Radha Kund. So that's the appearance of Radha Kund. There's several verses in the very skinny book by Rupa Goswami, Upadesh Amrita or Nectar of Instruction, glorifying Radha Kund as the most sacred of all places in the universe. As is Radharani so sacred and special. And one more pastime, the Malyahari Kund pastime, described by Raghunath Das Goswami. These are some images from what Malyahari Kund looks like today. Looks just like, you know, a, a little pond with algae all over it. And it probably didn't look too celebrated when, Rag when Raghunath Das Goswami was also there. But he, he didn't write many books, but the ones that he wrote were pretty amazing. And this, this book, Malyahari Kun, describes what we know in ISKCON as the Pearl Pastime. This young girl, does she know that pastime too? The pearl, Krishna growing pearls from a pearl tree? You know, of course. You're lucky to have such a inspirational mother that tells you all these nice stories. So we, you get to hear it again. Um, Krishna loves the cows and the cows love Krishna, of course. And Krishna became so inspired one day he uh, went to Nanda Maharaj and said, I'd like to make pearl necklaces for all of your cows. I'd like to grow some pearl trees. 
And Nanda smiled and said, pearls don't grow from pearl trees. <laughs> Actually, the story begins where Satyabhama is in Dwaraka saying, Krishna, I heard that when you were little, growing up in Gokul, going up in Vrindavan, you grew pearls from a pearl tree. Is that true? And Krishna said, yes. Can you tell the story? So she tells the story. He tells the story to Satyabhama. So Krishna then went to Mother Jasoda and said, I want to grow pearl trees so I can make pearl necklaces for all of Nanda Maharaj's cows. Can you give me some pearls so I can make a pearl garden? And Mother Jasoda smiled and Nanda Nandana. <laughs> pearls don't come from trees. They come from the ocean. And Krishna said, no, no, no. I've been with Nanda. We make many things. We dig a hole in the ground and put some seeds in the ground and cover up the seed and water the seed. And after some time, so many nice things grow. Can I get some pearls so I can make some pearl trees? You know how children are insistent again and again when they really want something. <laughs> and Mother just sort of just loved Krishna so much, he said very well. Nanda Maharaj has some in his storeroom and I'll get some. So she gave him some pearls. So Krishna went by the Timbali Hari Kund and started his pearl garden. And after some time, when his pearl garden started to grow, boop, little shoots came out of the ground. So he was so excited, he went to the gopis and said, come see my pearl garden. So they came, because it's right near Radhakund. And they just laughed and laughed. They said, those aren't pearl trees, those are thorn trees. And Krishna said, no, no, you'll see. It's pearl trees. And they just laughed and laughed and laughed and walked away. After some time, those little sprouts coming out of the ground very quickly grew and produced pearls. They all became pearl trees and very large and even fragrant pearls. And so Krishna brought the gopis to come see his pearl garden. And they were astonished. We never saw pearls from a pearl tree. So then Radharani wasn't going to be one-upped by Krishna. She said, let's make a better pearl garden than Krishna's pearl garden. Let's go by the side of the river Jamuna and take water for the river the Jamuna, and not only that, milk and yogurt, and we'll water our pearl trees with milk and yogurt by the side of the river Jamuna, and we'll have a better pearl garden than Krishna's pearl garden. So they took their pearls, and at Radharani's instigation, they went to their homes and broke into the storerooms and got some pearls and made a little pearl garden. And they were really happy when little shoots came out of the ground. So they brought Krishna to see their pearl garden and Krishna laughed and laughed and said, no, those aren't pearl trees, those are thorn trees. <laughs> and he laughed and laughed and went away. And sure enough, they were thorn trees. <laughs> and then Radha and the gopis were in big anxiety because we've taken pearls from our parents' storerooms without asking, how are we going to get them back? We have to put them back into the storerooms. Otherwise we're stealing from our parents. How can we do this? So they got this idea. They would take some gold and some other ornaments and bring them to Krishna Oh, I forgot to tell you what this image says. This is Krishna coming in asking the gopis. I, this is such a very important part of the story. 
and Krishna wanted pearls from the gopis to make necklaces from Nanda Maharaja's cows and Lalita that's the one with the, her hand on her hips there dressed in a peacock sari uh, saying I'm sorry <laughs> but Radharani's pearls are too good for your cows that's when he went to get pearls to make a pearl garden and grew the pearl garden so now they're in big anxiety what we're going to get pearls to replace the pearls that now Krishna has placed upon the cows and there were so many pearls he decorated not only all of Nanda Maharaj's cows but all the peacocks in Vrindavan and all the peacocks all the monkeys in Vrindavan that's a lot of monkeys so they sent their best negotiator and I haven't read the book but it's like I was told it's the biggest part because it's the Vaishya community and they did this bargaining back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and Krishna is saying just one of these pearls whatever you have in your hand there in that pre treasure chest it's not capable of matching even one of these pearls. Look how big and fragrant. <laughs> so it was no deal. And the gopis were very sad and they went back and gave the bad news to Radharani. And when they gave the bad news to Radharani, see there's the peacock with a <laughs> necklace. And there's a monkey with a pearl necklace. Um, Krishna said, you know what? Radharani's in such anxiety. I'll make a pearl necklace for her. And he became so inspired by the pearl necklace that he said it's, it should be put in a golden box with Radha's name on it. And it was, she was so inspired with the pearl necklace with the gold box with Radha's name on it. Make one for all the gopis and put them in a golden box and put their name on it. And give it as a gift. So the cowherd boys came and gave all these gifts to the gopis and now all their anxiety was gone. So Radha considered, we have to do something for Krishna and the cowherd boys. Here's Krishna giving some pearls to Radha. So many she's feeding them to the swans. <laughs> so they made a big feast. And of course Krishna was the guest of honor and all the cowherd boys were fed and Krishna was fed and everyone became happy. That's the Malya Hari Kund has a happy ending. There was some tension to get there, but uh, yeah, according to local tradition, those thorn bushes that grew up in the Gopi's gardens were Gunjaberry uh, bushes, and Gunjaberry is what Krishna loves to wear in the uh, some local traditions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's our preamble for tomorrow's Radhastami celebration here at the temple on Sunday, which I won't be here for, but somebody will be here. So I understand that as I was here last year around this time, right? And we were promoting Bhadra Purnima. There's a plan to do a Bhadra Purnima promotion Probably everybody here knows what this this one's all about. But the, Krishna appeared in the month of Shravan. And, excuse me, Balaram appeared in the month of Shravan. The, the Purnima of the previous month. So one month later, is, this is now Bhadra month, and the, in the Bhadra month, Krishna appears, and Radharani appears, and this very special 
benediction given in the twelfth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam is the Srimad Bhagavatam is such wonderful literature if on the full moon day of the month of Bhadra one places Srimad Bhagavatam on a golden throne don't worry we'll take care of the golden throne part <laughs> and gives it as a gift, he or she will attain the supreme transcendental destination. You know what that is? It's not, you know, in the suburbs of Hartford. <laughs> it's not the Trump Tower. It's not even in the heavenly planets. It's not even in Vaikuntha, it's Goloka. So it seems too easy, right? It's got to be an exaggeration, right? The Bhagavatam is just kind of like encourage people to do a good thing. So, but it's, it's not an exaggeration. It's, it's, um, it's a benediction and recognizing that benediction throughout ISKCON and including here in ISKCON, Connecticut, there's um, an interest in seeing the people receive the gift of Srimad Bhagavatam and give the gift of Srimad Bhagavatam and attain the supreme transcendental destination. So I don't know who's going to be the MC for this part of the program. Are you? You're the MC? Take it away. Mm -hmm. Here's the back to Mike. Anybody here for, from the book distribution team? Distributing books. So we. So we encouraging. You know, since Maharaj said about Bhajra Purnima, we're encouraging devotees and visitors to the temple to make use of this time and welcome Srimad Bhagavatam to their home. If anybody is interested, um, we can take down your names now.